Jindara. Well, that's the spirit of the people of the Nullarbor Plain. Well, if you do something wrong, it tells you about the law. An Aboriginal dreaming story says that after Juka, God created the earth. He sent his spirit down from out of the northern sky in the form of a great rock, which hit the land near the Great Australian Bight and then bounced into the sea. There, it sank from sight. From this sprang the spirit woman, Jukapa, and the spirit man, Juka, who found their way to the land from the sea through one of the many underground caves that honeycomb the Nullarbor Plain with streams of water that run out to the sea. From the cave, they saw the light of the sun, Jindu, and climbed towards it. As they reached the entrance, they were born of Mother Earth. Man was born. The Nullarbor Plain is a vast, ancient realm which stretches across the bottom of Australia. It is a place of great beauty and great power. It is one of the last true spaces. Despite its arid nature and its apparent emptiness, it is in fact full of life. All sorts of people go there, drawn by its size and its secrets. They test themselves in a landscape where once walked dinosaurs and diprotodons, the largest marsupial on the planet. One of the greatest challenges of the Nullarbor is actually to traverse it, crossing it either by necessity or choice. Some never make it. Among the early adventurers drawn to the Nullarbor was Captain Maitland Thompson, who started in the 1930s exploring the massive network of caves which are stored in the plains limestone bones. Captain Thompson hired pilots to find the caves and then used primitive ropes and ladders to descend into their depths. He made nine expeditions to the Nullarbor over 20 years. The Nullarbor, which was once an inland sea, is now a desert. Yet beneath its dust, connected to some of the caves, is an even deeper secret. Down there, under all the heat and thirst, is the largest subterranean water system in the world. This is the story of an Australian expedition of men and women cave divers who venture to the center of the Nullarbor Plain to explore those waters at a place called Panicum Plains. 1,600 kilometers from Adelaide. The divers begin by testing their equipment in an Adelaide pool, a place of placid contrast to the alien waters that lie ahead of them. It is their first chance to use their underwater propulsion vehicles called Aquazeps, the prototype of which was designed by an East German who escaped to the West. He used it to travel underwater across the river to freedom. Now they will be used by this team to explore the unknown depths within the Nullarbor. After training, they take time off to play a wild game called underwater hockey. It gives them a chance not only to show their skill, but also how competitive they can be. Normally mild-mannered, underwater they can suddenly turn into barracudas. Plus the cave environment itself is a little bit The unstable. divers get a final so briefing a from the expedition leader, Andrew White. And rocks and things tend to fall out of the roof of this cave. You have to be very, very careful, especially... They the are among the best cave in divers in the world. And we'll be setting up Together with other Australians, they held the record for the longest underwater cave dive, right set in 1983. On Much of the equipment has to be made specifically for this trip. The expedition will have to be completely self-contained to survive. 
There are no dive shops down the road at Pannikin Plains. There are no shops at all. A special two-way radio which will enable communication between the cave and the surface is designed and built by Ron Allen, the dive team leader. The expedition might be the most modern there is, yet as it sets out, it takes its place in the tradition of the great old explorers, following in the footsteps of John Eyre, who went into the Nullarbor almost 150 years before, going beyond the beyond. Bring a group of this many people out to the Nullarbor, living in hot, dry, dusty conditions, is a, quite a challenge. And uh, we've got you know, Australia's best divers here and a couple of uh, world-class international divers as well. And it's uh, yeah, quite a challenge. The first task when they reach Panican Plains is to rig the cave. To do this, they have to get the gear, all five tons of it, from the top of the cave down to the underground water's edge, hundreds of meters away. It is an immense effort, which takes three days and nights to complete. The descent is done through an exhausting series of stages, down steep slopes and sheer vertical drops. Down. It is hot and dangerous work. This is a place that demands respect and care. Stop. As they work, strange events are happening up above. A serpent-shaped plume hovering over the camp. A willy-willy wrecking a tent. A rainbow coming into the cave. And a large green and copper snake appearing by the cave mouth. Life in the camp settles into a regular <laughs> domestic routine. Come on, help me. Here's this one. Yeah. Dishes to clean. It's a hard life, but people cope without complaint. They're here to die of the cave, not have a camping holiday. Water is always a problem because it's so scarce and so precious. Ironically, none of the water in the cave is drinkable. So every day, the expedition has to travel miles to a bore to replenish supplies. Everything out here is thirsty. The water collected from the ball then has to be purified by a reverse osmosis process before being fit for consumption. While the chamber down below at the water's edge is converted into a highly efficient base camp, the job of keeping the air tanks filled for the divers 
never ends. Ellie's. It's about nine, ten hours worth of filling. <laughs> we'll have to get the guys to cut down on their air consumption on it. This is no good. Well, they could use their snorkel, I guess. Yeah. The air supply, along with the electricity to light the cave and charge yeah. the batteries, well, no is fed up. to the chamber all the way from the surface through a long, twisting series of pipes oh. and cables. They have compressors up there and generators and even a telephone. Yeah, it's pulled here from the surface. OK, all ready to go. You can start it up any time you like. The final stage of readiness is now reached. The equipment is prepared, so are the plans, and so are the divers. The first dive is about to be made. As part of their objectives, the team is conducting a series of scientific studies in conjunction with the University of Sydney. Dr. Julia James, senior lecturer in inorganic chemistry, is a leading world authority on cave atmospheres, minerals and waters. Well, there has always been a good relationship between the cave of the explorer and the scientist on the Nullarbor. And the initial exploration of the air caves, the airfield caves, had this excellent collaboration. Now we're going one step further, because even though our scientists can get into the airfield caves and collect samples and set specimens, we cannot get underwater. And the cave diving and the collaboration between the cave divers and the scientists, and I might add that some of the cave divers are in fact scientists themselves, gives us a new dimension. It gives me samples that I could not collect myself, very important samples that nobody else in the world has yet collected, and should give very valuable information about how those caves on the Nullarbor were formed. I regard this expedition as one of the Everests of cave diving. Cave diving, unlike mountain climbing, has to be done without having any idea where they're going. Nor do they know how deep they will have to go. Which means they have to plan their air consumption and decompression schedules for theoretical dives. Once the dive starts, they have to continually update and modify the plan as the cave environment changes. From afar, the staging of the lake room takes on the appearance of an amphitheater. It is a perfect setting for the great drama that is about to unfold. The divers have to prepare for a multitude of disaster scenarios. They have to be ready for any emergency from loss of air supply, to getting lost in the silt tossed up in the tunnel, to their equipment malfunctioning thousands of meters from the safety of the air. Down at the water's edge, the stage is set. Andrew and Chris are ready to go. It is from here that they take the plunge, going deep into the belly of the mother. The divers have to travel underwater for a whole kilometer at a depth of up to 30 meters. To reach their first objective and set up the final base camp in the same way as climbing Mount Everest, they utilize their support team and an ingenious equipment sled of their own design. The equipment we have could take us anywhere up to six kilometres into this passage, given that it was at the appropriate depth. I mean, if it gets deeper, it won't be that far. And also, we're at the mercy of the cave. It, it will determine how far we go. If there's further caverns and airfield chambers, 
who knows? And that's the real excitement of cave diving. You don't know what lays on beyond uh, the next step. It's not like mountaineering where you can survey the top of the mountain, you can see how far you have to climb, you know what equipment you have to take. Every dive here presents a new challenge because you have to recalculate the dive, uh, take different pieces of equipment which are appropriate for that particular dive and that adds to the excitement and the adrenaline that uh, we will experience when exploring. Their base camp will be Concord Landing, a huge air chamber under the earth, which they discovered last time they dived at Panican Plains. It is located 100 metres directly beneath the main highway across the Nullarbor. Along the way, they encounter the Squeeze, a narrow place in the tunnel, nearly too tight for their mass of equipment to negotiate. Additional hazard is the silt encountered in this area, which threatens to blind them and obstruct their vision of the path that leads them to safety and the air in Concord. Concord Chamber is as big as several football fields strung together and as high as a four-storey building. It's not a place that invites habitation by any life form, let alone humans. Its air has an elevated carbon dioxide level. The divers camp here for 24 hours to allow their bodies to adjust. They also have to cross it from end to end to reach the next dive departure point. They have to get out of the water, cross a steep, jagged terrain go through more water and then climb more rocks. The low-grade air combined with the effort of crossing makes it hard going. The divers suffer bad headaches and become lethargic. Yet Concord is a place of great beauty, a netherworld of the darkest dark, in which their lights pick out a phantom landscape older than time itself. Uh, it has to be in sealed tubes and is a little bit more difficult to get back out over. It is at this point that the divers first test their two-way radio to the surface. Amazingly, it is capable of sending transmittable signals through solid rock. We have probably another 10 hours surfacing of all to put in. The radio contact would be critical to the survival of the mission. <laughs> Meanwhile, up above in the camp, life goes on in relative luxury. Robin, it's excellent. Well, the boys on the surface are having lamb chops and champagne. And we're pigging out on back peas. <laughs> Have some more. Hmm? I believe I said that. But I'm doing it all comic and we're hitting the bloody week. 
Like the last smaller can. Like the last stew. There's some bread there. Concord Chamber is hot when they work and cold when they rest. But for now, it has become home. They sleep in the endless dark, where there is no morning and no sense of time at all. Now Andrew and Chris forge ahead from Concord Chamber in one of the many exploratory dives done by the team. Cave diving needs superhuman effort as well as skill and nerve. The divers go in pairs, but each has to be self-reliant and capable of handling any emergency on their own. Cave divers are a rare breed who bypass the usual fears of many people of claustrophobia, being trapped, drowning, or dying from lack of air. Cave diving is one of the most dangerous pursuits on Earth. It has taken hundreds of lives. But despite the danger, there is also enjoyment of the experience which is like nothing else. The sensation of diving with neutral buoyancy in the saline waters under the nullarbor is the same as in outer space. The water is so clear that it is virtually invisible, reinforcing the illusion of floating outside the Earth's atmosphere. Now from here, Andrew and Chris will go further into the abyss. During their infinite voyaging, the team must periodically stop and decompress to avoid getting the bends. Dr. Des Gorman, the head of the hyperbaric unit at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and the expedition's medical advisor. The, the easiest way to explain decompression sickness to someone who has had no experience of diving or physics is to think what happens when they take the top off a Coca-Cola bottle. When the top is removed and the pressure is released, all the bubbles come out of the uh, out of solution. That's exactly what happens in people's bodies when they return to the surface after a dive. As the pressure is released, gas can come out of solution. If a diver develops decompression sickness during the final penetration, and that's where it's most likely to, to occur, then there's a, a problem retrieving them from that deep section all the way back out to the mouth of the cave. Now to do that, they'll have to breathe very high concentrations of oxygen for very long periods of time. They'll have to have oxygen-rich mixtures all the way back to the surface, but nevertheless, it's still going to mean that even if someone originally had mild disease at the end of the deep penetration, they'll be very sick indeed by the time they get to the surface. While they're decompressing, before their return to the lake chamber, Andrew and Chris release a special dye to monitor the movement of the water as part of the University of Sydney studies. They discover the water is moving south in the direction of the sea.
All right, it usually happens at the end of expeditions that you start working together as a team. You've not Later up above, the expedition the gathers for a final briefing where they make the difficult decision and to make one last dive. And you've They've been in the Nullarbor now for three weeks and the fatigue is starting to show. Well, we said in Adelaide before we left that the objective of the trip, the, the, the one thing that was driving the expedition was uh, we would dive this cave within uh, the limits of human endurance and within the technical limitation of our equipment and the sole objective was diving the cave, trying to push to the end. Well, we're at the end of the trip, but we're not at the end of the cave. Uh, to do another dive really strains the resources and strains the manpower in terms of getting gear out. But if we do a lightweight trip, I'm sure we'll have uh, quelled that uh, human trait of being curious and wanting to do these things and uh, it would be unfortunate that we've come out all this way and spent all this time to go home and never know whether or not that lead continues on. Here's some great stuff. Yay! <laughs> As we get further in, I guess, you get a, a mixture of um, excitement and a little bit of tension because you know that uh, you're getting further out from, uh, from home, but also the excitement of knowing that you're going to be breaking into new territory and the things that you might find. It's more an overall sensation, I guess, all your senses take it in. You're, if I can perhaps try and describe it, you're in a massive series of chambers in this cave. The water's crystal clear and you're floating through the middle of these great underwater caverns with white limestone walls all around you as you look both above and below and you sail on and you realise of course no one's ever been there before and you're the first person that's privileged to be in those in those waters and in those caverns and somehow that sensation uh, overall adds up to quite a, quite a strong feeling. Now Andrew and Chris push further ahead into the void They've left their trusty aquaceps behind them as the cave narrows. From their previous dive, they know that the passageway is barely large enough for them to get through, but they continue along, floating like free spirits in the underworld. Without a continuous line to guide them back to base, they could easily lose their way and be trapped out there, lost in space forever. The divers passed through a labyrinth of catacombs, past a vast array of marine fossils, before the tunnel suddenly ran out, blocked by a pile of submerged boulders. 
They'd reached the midpoint of their theoretical plan. They'd reached the limit. It is three kilometers through the cave back to the safety of the lake. When they finally returned home, they'd been away for three days. During the return, the divers recall their accomplishments, satisfied that they did them, and at the same time followed the critical rules that kept them alive during these penetrations. Each diver knows from training and past experience that they must always run a continuous line so they may retrace their return, that they must save at least two-thirds of their air to exit on should there be a failure of their buddy's air, and that they must always carry three lights each, for it's obvious that to be lost in the world of total blackness without a light, underground, underwater, would fulfill the deepest fear a person could have. I think we're all fairly um, safety conscious. We, we work with as many backup systems as we can. We're, we're in conjunction in this group here with a number of overseas people. So I think now the cave diving is taking on an international flavour, which means that a lot of expertise is coming in to make sure that we're all using the most up-to-date and, and fail-safe systems that we can. Danger is a relative thing. I mean, you can't say this is dangerous because for this group of people, we're highly trained, we have the appropriate equipment for the dive, but to anyone else to even contemplate doing this sort of activity without the training or equipment, uh, it's like holding a gun at your head. So, you know, they're the, they're the extremes. Time for the expedition has run out. The journey into the unknown is over. I forgot, I lost track. Should have noted their um, six metre bikes and you could have worked out their, uh, what, their three metre bikes. <laughs> As the last dive finishes back at the lake room, the team does the final decompression to rid their bodies of excess nitrogen. But the nitrogen is the only thing they discard. They've brought everything back with them, all their rubbish, even their own personal waste. They follow the saying, take nothing but photographs, leave nothing but footprints. We're back. <laughs> Even though they sound light-hearted, they are serious-minded people. They're very respectful of the cave environment. All right, eh? Hello. Hey, good dive. Oh. That was... Uh, just in the corner. Just down the bottom here. Yeah, yeah. Just the corner. <laughs> Bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, I thought, oh, we've got a welcoming party. <laughs> well, it's nice to see some more people to talk to from the ones I've been bored with. <laughs> a long time to be locked up in a cave with Chris Brown. <laughs> the packing up has begun to get all the gear all the way back up to the surface. During the many dives by various team members, a ton of equipment was taken through to Concord Chamber. At the same time, the snake which had appeared earlier, up above, is now down in the cave. The snake rears at people as they pass along the path, but it doesn't try to bite them. Suddenly, up above, a huge menacing cloud appears directly over the cave. Meteorologists have since identified it as a freak and rare cyclonic storm. This fearful spectre dumps down two years of rain in only 25 minutes. The enormous weight of the floodwater is about to cause the cave to collapse on top of most of the people who are still below, including the film crew. While fleeing, they capture one of the most terrifying sounds on Earth, an avalanche. afternoon, Frank Warwick. 13 people are reported to be buried Hopes alive. Hopes of saving 13 people plane. trapped in a cave collapse on the Nullarbor A plane. massive rescue underway to free 13 trapped cavers. Uh, surface to chamber, surface to chamber. 
Are you receiving? Over. The people on the surface fear that their companions trapped below have been killed or injured. At least they still have their communication system. Yeah, Vicky's um, said it's looking fairly unstable. The main lowering block we've uh, lower off is dropped about a metre. Receiving you, Christopher. Good day, Ron. I'm receiving you. You're a little bit weak. Over. Everyone's intact. Um, people down here are Liz, Sonia, Rob. The people Liz, who were halfway up the cave had to race for their lives back down to the lake. They watched in horror as the cave collapsed behind them. Panic and Plains the next day is no longer the same place. The storm brought 200 kilometer an hour winds, wrecked the camp, and completely changed the cave mouth. In five hours, an estimated 300 million litres of water poured into the cave. It is realised that thousands of tonnes of rock have avalanched into the cave. Team members from both directions will have to establish a new way out. The people below will have to follow an exact path. It is very dangerous. At any moment, the whole roof could come crashing down. The people down below have gathered their resources and their wits. They work out they have enough food and water to last them a few days. In the circumstances, they keep remarkable spirits. They are professionals. Miraculously, no one has been hurt. Yeah, everyone is in um, great shape. Um, the rock pile, uh, Wes and uh, Rob have been up there again this evening. It looks uh, well, initially fairly um, unstable. Um, the top of that um, yeah, flying fox and the bottom of that pitch area is just um, a new cave altogether. Cameraman Wes Skiles, who at great risk to his life had recovered his camera among the collapsed boulders, records his remarkable escape from the cave. What you're looking at here is a mass of rock lying atop of the path we used to walk. Some two, three, maybe even four meters at points of rock is on top of our equipment that used to lie here. This huge boulder takes up the whole frame of the camera, was not there yesterday. We need now, because of time, to start journeying upwards on the final route through the choke. Careful, Colin. It's real slippery and real unstable. Try not to grab a hold of any rocks that might move, try to use your feet as much as possible. A lot of these real big rocks are still very loose. Things are very unstable here. A pile of equipment covered in mud lies undisturbed. Just feet away other equipment is buried completely below. In the ceiling you can see where water has poured through, loosening new rock ready to fall. Finally, after a 24-hour ordeal, the first survivor appears. Well, I believe it's near time that the world should know the dream and story that the Waraga tribe, the Waraga people. Miles. We have 
Did you see a snake in the cave? Wow, that's a good spirit. There was a, you know, a, a spirit will guide you safely back. That's amazing. You know, people look at the snake and say it's a evil thing. <laughs> You know, that sort of thing, you know? Well, it's looking at you, it's watching you, it's taking care of you. <laughs> In one sense, you know, you look at the storm and the spirit were trying to say to you, you know, go away, take off. But with that appearance of the snake, he was trying to say, take it easy. It takes a total of six long hours for them all to get out. Bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> you! Piece of cake. Great stuff. Hey, Great hi. stuff. Hey. Hello. Hello. What the spirits are telling you, well, they're not quite ready yet. But we will show you when it's time. In the final squeeze climbing out, I can just pass you this and you can turn it and point it around back at me. Yeah, no problem. Good be out. <laughs> Unbelievable. Welcome aboard. Thanks. Thanks for pulling me up. No All of a sudden, freak storm come along and the spirits are saying, hey, come on, you fellas, get out. Keep coming up here, buddy. Well, I believe, you know, studying a little bit now, but that the spirits in there were, they were telling you fellas to stop. you not come out with well, a snake, you know, he would have come and told the other spirits to come to help you. Well, the appearance of that snake, they don't mean to say that you can't go back in there again. No, well, I, I think you ought to go back in there again. 